We won't be able to share it all tonight, but we'll share what we can. As we approach the time when we exchange gifts with friends and family, have you ever received the greatest gift of all? Dr. Van Dyke explains what that is and challenges you to make it your own special gift this year. Are you ready for Christmas? Are you excited? If so, why could it be because you are thinking about what you're going to get? The Christmas presents, which have become more and more the sum and substance of our celebration of what we call Christmas. We know that it's the case with children, but let us, let us, let's the fact, what, let's face it, it is true for a lot of adults as well. In fact, Christmas is about giving, or to be more specific, a gift, but not the kind of giving we associate with all two secular observance of Christmas these days, involving shopping until you drop, wrapping in gaudy paper and tinsel, trim given out of a sense of responsibility because we know those who are giving us a present will be expecting one from us. Boy, that's true. And <laughs> See, last year, did you give me a present last year? Uh, oh, you did. I'll give you one this year then. The truth essence of Christmas is expressed that beloved verse of Scripture familiar to millions, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him shall not perish, but have everlasting life. Whatever other gifts you might receive this Christmas, there is none that compares with this. It is the greatest gift. Why is that so? because it is rooted in love, and this is absolutely amazing. Sinful, ordinary men, hateful as we are, God loves us. Martin Luther once said, if I were God and these wild people were as contemptible as they now be, I would knock the world in pieces, but instead God loved. Let's face it, our giving is often done out of a sense of obligation because it is expected, because there would be hurt feelings if we didn't give, and even before we are having to keep up with the Joneses. It is sometimes done out of a grudging feeling rather than love, and that takes away the value of the gift. So God's love to us is the perfect gift, because there's only one motivation behind it, love. Because it is personal, God didn't just give us more things. He gave us his son, his only begotten son. You have heard the saying, the gift without the giver is bare. Well, God gave us himself since Jesus Christ was God in the flesh. We call this the incarnation. There can be no greater gift than this. Isn't it sometimes true that when we give, we give nothing of ourselves. We are willing to buy something, but don't expect us to get involved with the recipients. Not so with God, because it is free. It is unconditional. We could never have deserved it. There is none righteous, not one ever. For all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God, Romans 3.10 and in Romans 3.23. We could never have earned it, for by grace you have been saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not as a result of works that no one should boast. Ephesians 2, 8 and 9. The only way we can get this gift is for God to give it to us. The wages of sin is death, but the perfect gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. Romans 6, 23. Because it is lasting, those Christian presidents, presidents we give and get will be lost. They will wear out, tear up, be consumed, or be discarded. Sometimes almost before the wrapping paper in which we re receive them is disposed of, but not so with God's gift. It is eternal. That means it will never end. Once we have received this precious gift, it is ours forever. For I am convinced that neither death nor life, 
nor angels, nor principalities, nor things present, nor things to come, nor power, nor death, nor death, death, nor any other created thing shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord, Romans 8, 38, 39. Because it is needed, if there's any one thing that characterizes the gift most of us give and receive at Christmas, it is that they are not needed, not really. We may want it, but wanting and needing are two different things. And sadly, greed is so much involved in the worldly celebration of Jesus' birth. I know of a family that gives not one shirt or blouse, but 10. Not one joggling outfit or windsuit, but five to the same person who already has several of these items stashed away. Need it? No. But all of us need God's Christmas gift. Without it, we perish, as John 3.16 makes plain. Without God's gracious gift, we are lost, and that is a terrible thing to complete. Though sadly, millions of people today never give it a thought. The word perish means just what it implies. The only way to avoid this is to receive God's grace by faith. His grace displays in Jesus, as John 3, 16 makes it clear, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish. And in Acts 4, 12, we are told that there is salvation in no other one, for there is no other name under heaven that has been given among men by which we must be saved. Maybe you who are reading this have already received this gift. If so, then why not spend a good portion of your Christmas celebration praising God and thanking Him for loving you enough to send you His Son to keep you from perishing and give you the incomparable gift of eternal life. Even more, why not pass this great gift on to someone else who needs it by witnessing to them, telling them that they too can receive this great gift through faith. If you don't have this gift, then I plead with you to take advantage of the opportunity and receive Christ into your heart by faith. Jesus is saying to you, the Christ whose birth we celebrate, behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come into him and will dine with him and he with me, Revelation 3.20. If you do that, if you do, then I can sincerely say, Merry Christmas. <laughs> I would like for each person to give that to somebody and remind them why Christ came. Not only to save us, but to give us eternal life. How many would do that? Find somebody and get them to read this. Because see, without the sowing of the seed, there's no little blade that will come up. No stalk will come up and there'll be no air of corn. But somebody's got to plant the seed. So I challenge this church to find somebody this week that you know that needs Jesus Christ and just give that to them or even share your testimony. And then you'll be planting the seed. Then somebody will come along later on and water it. But who gives the increase? God. You need not worry about what you sow. I mean, if you sow God's word, then you're going to get what you sow. So I appreciate you doing that. And that's, that's a powerful piece of paper there with good information on it. <coughs> okay, the first scripture I want you to put on the board. Uh, it's uh, Luke 19, verse 10. Let's put that on the board. I've got about 25 minutes here. <clears throat> a lot of word to share. Everybody look at the board. Why do we have Christmas? What is Christmas all about? Well, for the Son of Man came to seek and to save that which was lost. Now I want you to put yourself into that equation there. You were lost. I was lost. <coughs> Susan shared her testimony with uh, Willie back there, Tillman, tonight as we had our prayer meeting. 
young girl, 14 years old, didn't know she was lost. What in the world, what, what sin could a girl 14 years old working on the farm, what sin could she possibly have? And yet she went to that tent meeting. She didn't know that God was drawing her to that tent meeting. And she sat there and saw the vision of Christ being crucified and was saved. And God changed her life from that point on forevermore. But God seeked her out. God seeked every one of us out. Why did he seek us out? To save us. Because we were lost. If he had not seeked us out, and when we died, we would end up in a burning hell. But we know that that's not God's plan for man. God takes no pleasure in punishing the wicked. So God gave his son to die on that cross. And there's a scripture that I want you to see, and it's found in Hebrews. <clears throat> I'll find it right here. Hebrews. Where are you at, Hebrews? Here we go. Hebrews chapter 2. I'm sorry. Hebrews chapter 10. Go to Hebrews chapter 10. There's a lot in the book of Hebrews. Hebrews chapter 10. Boy, where do I start? <laughs> well, let's start with verse 1, okay? Everybody there, verse 1. For since the, the law had merely a rude outline foreshadowing of the good things to come, instead of fully expressing those things, it can never by offering the same offering or sacrifices continuously, year after year, make perfect those who approach its altars. So it was a shadow of things to come. And what was the things to come was Christ, was the true sacrifice. Now the Hebrew writer says, for as it were otherwise, next verse, for if it were otherwise, would those sacrifices not have stopped? In other words, if those offerings would have satisfied God and could have bought our salvation and redeemed us, then they would have not stopped being offered. Can we see that? It's very important you see that. Okay? But it didn't do the job. So God had to stop the animal sacrifice. Since the worshipers had once for all been cleansed, they would no longer have any guilt uh, or consciousness of sin. All right, go to the next verse. But as it is, these sacrifices annually brings a fresh remembrance of sins to be atoned for. Now just think, every time they would take those animals and offer them on the altar, it would remind us, or the people of that day, of their sins. And then the guilt would come back. And then the condemnation would come back. And it was a vicious circle, even though some Christians are still suffering with that because they really not have laid hold of the power of the blood that God holds nothing against you. If you've accepted Christ, you've been made holy. You are perfect in God's eyes. Let's go to the next verse. Because the blood of bulls and goats is powerless to take his sins away. So all it did was remind them of their sins. It didn't take their sins away, but it was a covering until the real sacrifice came, which was Jesus Christ. You say, well, what does this have to do with Christmas? Well, just hold on, you'll see. Next verse. Hence, when he, Christ, entered into the world. Now, how about that? And when was that? Well, that's why we're celebrating Christmas. Christ entered into the world as a little baby. All right, we see the picture there. He said, now, he said, sacrifices and offerings you have not desired. Now, who is he said? Find out who he is, that's Jesus. 
Jesus said, sacrifices and offerings, you, God the Father, have not desired. But instead, you, God, Father, have made ready a body for me, for Jesus, to offer. Everybody got that? Now, God made a body for Jesus to come down and, 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 and incarnate into that body where he could offer his bodies for the sins of the world. Not just to cover them, but to remove them as far as the east is from the west. And until we accept what God has said, there'll be no real peace in your life. You're sitting there. I'm standing here. I'll use myself as an example. That way I'll, I won't get into trouble. Bob, do you have any sins on you? No. That didn't even jar some of you. Do you have any sins on you? My weak. Do you have any sins on you? Well, if you say that you have and you uh, believe in the blood and trust in Christ to cleanse you, you're not agreeing with the word of God. And we wonder why aren't we delivered from this condemnation and guilt we feel all the time. How do you remember when Peter was up on the housetop waiting for something to be cooked? If I got your attention. How many remembers that? Do I have to show it to you in the Bible? Do you remember it? If you remember that, that Peter was up there and this sheet came down, remember that? How many remember that? Raise your hands. I want to make sure we're on the right page. All right. This is very important that, I, that you understand this. <clears throat> God told Peter, <clears throat> take and kill and eat. And Peter said, not so, Lord. I, I, I don't touch anything that's unholy. And what did God say? Don't you call what I've made holy, unclean, that's what he used, Peter used the words unclean, anymore. Just go ahead and take the slap in the face, it's okay. Bam. Have you ever been there? Raise your hands, don't lie to your pastor, I know you have. If you haven't, come up here and talk with me. So uh, the Lord had to get on to Peter and say, Peter, what I have cleansed, don't you call unclean anymore. Anybody in this place clean? <laughs> now you let that get in your psyche. Your socket, that's a good one. Get in your psyche, in your mind, in your heart, in your spirit. That will set you free. The fight is over. It's finished. Complete. God has made you holy by the one sacrifice given once and for all to take care of every sin of the past, the present, and the future. And we have to walk in, listen to that, walk in that consciousness. Now, I don't walk with you guys, but every day, what are you thinking about? What time dinner is? <laughs> well, you know, I, sometimes I'm ready for dinner too. But you have to be conscious of what the Lord has done. It's because so many people are sin conscious. And us preachers sometimes don't uh, help them out a lot because we're constantly reminding you, you're just a bunch of sinners. Well, that ain't true. That's a lie. God's cleansed you. Bob, don't you call my people unclean that I have cleansed with the blood of my son. Yeah. 
Because as you meditate and thank him and your heart begins to get caught up into that and praise, oh God, thank you. Thank how many of us have struggled? Oh God, we've walked the floor wide. Oh God, you know, we got to uh, receive. As many as receive. Now, thank God for first John one nine. I didn't say we couldn't sin. I don't get up every morning thinking about let's see how many times I could sin today. But if the Holy Spirit shows me that I've sinned, not the devil, he ain't got nothing to do with it. He'll put condemnation and guilt on you. Let's finish reading that. Next. In burnt offering, now Jesus is speaking here in the book of Hebrews. In burnt offerings and sin offerings, you, God, have taken no delight. God takes no light delight in, in uh, these offerings. Next. Then I said, then Jesus said, behold, here I am. Here I am, Jesus, coming to do your will, Father, O God. How many sees it? To fulfill what is written of me in the volume of the book. Next. When he said, just before you have neither desired nor have you taken delight in sacrifice and offerings and burnt offerings and sin offerings, all of which are offered according to the law. All right, next. He then went on to say, behold, there I am. That is Christ. Christ said, here I am coming to do your will, Father. That's Jesus talking to the Father there in the scriptures. How many see that? So when you remember what I said, when you read the scriptures, who's talking? Paul talking, God's talking, Jesus is talking, devil's talking. <laughs> he said, went on to say, he, he then went on to say, Behold, here I am according to your will. That is Jesus here. There I am. Jesus said, Here I am. Thus he does away with and annuls the first former order as a means of expirating sin, so that he may inaugurate and establish the second, the latter order. And next verse. In accordance with this, that is the will of God, we have been made holy, consecrated, and sanctified through the offering made once for all of the body of Jesus Christ, the anointed one. And when was that? offered 2,000 years ago and when was the body when did his body come on this earth through the Virgin Mary 2,000 years ago that little baby Jesus was the body that Christ was going to come down and, and, and enter and that was his sacrifice his body was to be the sacrifice that would take away all the sins but notice what it says and has been made made you know when you're made holy, I guess you're holy. <laughs> Who made you holy? God. Now look at that script. Let it burn in the recesses of your being. If you don't understand this, you'll always be, we'll always be conscious of sin. And then that brings the guilt and the condemnation into your life. And then that brings the physical manifestation of many physical problems. Hello? It's awful quiet out there tonight. Now, you need to go home and read that all the way down. Who made you holy? By what? By one sacrifice. Now let's read that again. In accordance with this will of God. All right, now notice this. It was, I'm paraphrasing. It was the will of God to make us holy, consecrate us, and sanctify us through what? The offering made once for all of the body of Jesus Christ, the anointed one. And when did Jesus' body come on the earth? Christmas, that's what we're celebrating Christmas is about. 
So when we as Christians celebrate Christmas, it's just not a little baby in the manger. It's the body, the offering, the sacrifice that was laid on the offering to make us holy and free. And now we can come into the very presence of God without guilt and condemnation anymore. That liberty is the liberty of the Spirit when we agree with the Word of God and get our minds renewed to believe more about what God has done through Christ than what Adam has done. Adam messed us all up. But Christ came and his body that was born on Christmas Day was a sacrifice and he entered that body and that body was the offering that set us free. So it's more than a little baby Jesus in a manger. It's the one sacrifice that has taken away the sins of the world. John the Baptist put it this way, Behold the Lamb of God that takes away the sins of the world. But you've got to receive it. But it's got to become a reality in you. See, I've struggled with this over the years. I'll be honest, and all of you have, I know. All of us struggle with it. Some of you are still struggling now. And if I'm not careful, I can find myself leaning over on that side too. Especially when I eat too much ice cream. <laughs> but I am more conscious of the one sacrifice that God gave. And when we received him as our personal savior, we receive not only our sins forgiven, but we've been made holy, consecrated, yes. set apart to God. We don't belong to ourselves; we belong to him. Yes. And everybody has got to make that decision. Sure, when Rick was uh, standing there, I knew people disagreed with what he was saying, but that's where his faith is. And I ain't about to knock it down. Well, what happens if he dies? He ain't going to die. He that believeth in me shall never die. Oh, he might stop breathing. Ship his body back. We'll put it out there in the grave. But he's alive. Be more alive than all of us. Sometimes you'll get so tired of the doctors, you just say, well, Lord. <laughs> you just shove all your money out there and put it out there in a pile and just say, all right, I'm putting the whole nine yards out there. I mean, you know what I'm talking about. If you don't win, you can't lose. You've already won. Because <laughs> God, God annulled death. Through Jesus Christ. It is more than just having our sins forgiven. My goodness, we are sons and daughters of the living God. We've been adopted into his family. He did it for us. So our sins being forgiven, that's just one little aspect of, of, the, of the blessings of God. You are now a son of God. Gosh, 10 more minutes. I ain't got started yet. Put... Uh, 1 John 3. 1 John 3. Oh, this is so powerful. Put it up on the board. That is a powerful verse. Look at that. 3 1. Look at that. Mm. There we go. See what an incredible quality of love the Father has given shown, restored on Mike. Greg, this is James, Mr. James. Put your name in there. Incredible quality of love, the agape love, has restored on Rick and Missy and every one of us. Now you've got to accept that. He made you holy. 
by the one sacrifice, that little baby that came on Christmas Day, born in a manger, that was the sacrifice that was going to be laid on the, on the altar, on the cross. It wasn't Santa Claus. I'm not being mean. I mean, I was 45 when I quit believing in Santa Claus. <laughs> Susan said, honey, you got to face it. <laughs> There's no Santa Claus. <laughs> no, there isn't. And I don't know how Santa Claus got involved with Christmas. I, I've read, I've read some things about it. I'm not going that way. <laughs> but we want to make sure that our children know what Christmas is. And that it's a time, sure, to give and to receive. And for families to get together and lift up Jesus. When my family comes, Susan and me are always there, ready to give our testimony. Because we know that as we acknowledge all the good things that are in us, our faith is energized. If we never get tired of sharing our testimony, even to our own children, because I tell you, they haven't heard it yet. All the pre teaching that I've taught, you ain't heard it yet, none of it yet, hardly any of it. Isn't that true? What did I preach three weeks ago? Not fussing at you, but I can't remember myself, and I preached it. That's why, that's why I stay in the Bible, that I won't forget. I thought maybe you'd help me out a little bit by remembering. How many love me? It's getting thin, isn't it? Okay, all right. Look what he says now. See what? See, John is... Uh, an incredible quality of love that the Father has. He's all, he's bent out of shape like I do sometimes. I get bent out of shape. I'm overwhelmed with what God has done. You know what God told Moses with the burning bush? He said, take off your sandals for the ground that you stand on is holy. The ground? God can make the ground holy? Where do you think this came from? Ground. Now listen, if God's made you holy, quit arguing with God. If God has consecrated you, consecrated, is that a word? Consecrated. Well, you know what I'm talking about. Y'all educated, you know what I'm talking about. Look, he's, he's, he's overwhelmed, has given, shown, restored on us that we should be permitted to be named and called and counted the children of God. Woo! Now we can come right into the very throne room of God. And we can talk to Abba Father. We can share our hearts. We can give him praise and glory. Time is moving and I've got to move fast. There's much more I want to say. Well, finish reading that. Turn to uh, St. John 3. And I've got to end on this. Because I know you all got to get your night sleeping in. Let's start with John 3, starting with 15. <clears throat> are we there? We are there. Everybody see it on the board. In order that everyone who believes in him, is anybody in here that believes on the Lord? Raise your hand with excitement and joy in your heart. The Lord has saved us. Oh, thank you, Jesus, to know that my children are going to heaven. Hallelujah. And my wife. I'll live with her for out eternity. And I'll live with you guys too, I guess. <laughs> Vice versa. <laughs> All right. In order that everyone who believes, everyone who believes, whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. In him who cle cleaves to him, trusts in, relies on him, may not perish but have eternal life and actually live forever. Hallelujah. Live forever. Go to the next verse. Here we go. 
Bing! For God so loved the world that he dearly prized the world, that he even gave up his only begotten unique son, so that whoever believeth in, trusts in, cling to, rely on him, shall not perish, come to destruction, be lost, but have eternal, everlasting life. Next verse. This thing gets excited. Some of you might start floating directly, so just, just hold on. For God did not send the Son into the world in order to judge, to reject, to condemn, to pass sentence on the world, but that the world might find salvation and be made safe and sound through Him. Next. This is getting good, isn't it? Somebody can shout. Go ahead. I don't care. Shout. Ice enough. Don't shout too much. Well, I don't know if I can read that small writing. Well, I'll turn my head. Turn it this way. Oh, this thing's getting good. If I start floating, don't get excited. He who believes in him, who clings to, trusts and relies on him is not judged. Now, we know in... Uh, Second Corinthians chapter 5, verse 10, I think it is, that we'll stand at the judgment seat of Christ. For what? For what we've done in the flesh. For our works. So if you don't have any works, you don't get no candy. I mean, that's the basis of it, you know. But aren't you glad you got works? So you're, you're not working for your salvation. You're working for God because you love him, but he's going to reward us by what we do. Now notice what it says. Judge, he who trusts him never comes up for judgment. For him there is no rejection, no condemnation. He occurs no damnation. But he who does not believe, cleaves to, rely on, trust in, his judge already, he has already been convicted and has already received his sentence because he has not believed in and trusted in the name of the only begotten Son of God. He is condemned for refusing to let his trust rest in Christ's name. Now, here's the good news. That last part, Jesus took care of all of that for us. Do you see that up there? You know why we're not going to be judged? Because he stood in the place and took our judgment. He took it all. He was our substitute. I'm going to tell you this story, and then I'm going to let you go home. How many has got ice cream at home? See, One. Who else? One, two, just two. I had ice cream. I ate it all last time. Split the ice cream. I want you to think about this for a moment. These two twins grew up. They loved each other when they were young. They played. They went to school. One became a pastor. The other became a robber. Ended up killing somebody. Was put in jail. And was going to be electrocuted. So his twin brother, who was the pastor, a week before he was to be electro electrocuted, his brother, the pastor, went to see him in jail. He looked just exactly the same. You could not tell them any difference. They looked exactly the same. And so the pastor went in and seen his brother and tried to get him to accept Christ and he wouldn't, he wouldn't do it. So he said, brother, what I'm going to do is I'm going to take your place. Take your clothes off. I'm going to take mine off. I'll put yours on and you put mine on. And when the guard comes, he'll let you out and you're free. And I will take the chair and be electrocuted in your place. No greater love that a man can have than for a man to lay down his life for a friend. That twin brother loved his brother because, you see, he knew where he was going to go. As soon as, as soon as he died, his body died, he was free, and he was with the Lord. But later on, this is a true story, his brother became a Christian, became a pastor, and took his place in preaching the gospel. I 
I see that type of love in, in many of you. I see it in my brother back there that's a missionary. Does anybody know what it's like to go to India? No, I don't, and I don't want to know. But I have a little idea because I've read a little bit about it, but it's not like being there experiencing it. I've, I've gone into the, to the you can saw places where nobody else would go. Angels wouldn't trot. I've been through all of that in, a, in, a, in America in my lifetime and witnessed and sharing Christ. But to think that Christ came to, and loved, you've got to make it personal. God loved Greg. God loved Mike. If you'd have been the only one. Eddie? God loves you. So much. That hit me one day and I said, Lord, I want to live for you. And that's why I'm committed. I don't fear death. I don't fear nothing anymore. You know what I fear? That I will not do the will of my Father in heaven. If I die in the process, that's okay. Because you see, I'm not going to die. Because I believe the word of God. Say, so you got to get that locked in your brain. And when you go out there to witness, and I told uh, Willie back there, uh, Tillman, he's got a heart for souls. And I know many of you do too, but I'm just singling him out. I want him to go with Susan and me one day and just see how we function in Walmart, how we function out there when people come around and what we do to share the gospel. He needs to see that because that's an example. Because all the fear that's holding the body of Christ down. We go shopping and we know everything about sharing Christ with anybody. Can I be honest? Be honest. Is that not true? Yeah, yeah it's true. And I'm not trying to put you down. I love you. But that's true. Chop, 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 chop. And souls all around. You can share Christ. We have everything in this assembly for you to be a soul winner. And your faith will never be energized until you start acknowledging to other people. I wish we had some more time, but we'd run out of time. I was going to have, I was going to show how, how you could do it, but I'll, I'll let that be another time. But this Christmas, think about it and begin to be that witness out in the street. Right everywhere you go. You go to the bathroom at, at, uh, at uh, some place, you always leave one of those. You can always track me down by my tracks. Yeah, Bob's been here. Susan's been here. I want to say the same thing about my congregation. We've got to pass over that bridge and be that witness in our generation and quit reading about Peter, James, and John, what they did, and start being Peter, James, and John. Come on, love me a little bit. Huh? You say, well, Bob, I'm doing it. Well, I'm just encouraging you to continue to do it. Do it and continue to do it. Because I tell you what, when we meet here and you do it everywhere you go, I'll guarantee you, you just won't sit there. You have got to share something. You've got to share what the Lord's done through me. My goodness, it's so exciting. And I think all the hundreds of people that I've witnessed to, uh, I'll, say, I'll say the last year, I'll just use the last year, I think three people turned me down. Didn't bother me. Just brush off my shoes. Love you anyway. And go to somebody else. Because there's plenty of people out there you can witness to. Remember, Christ has done his part. Now we don't want to let him down. Let's be that witness for him. Amen? Let's pray. God, I pray that the power of God, the anointing, the strength and the power of the Holy Spirit would be energized into your people. And when they go shopping now, they'll have one thing on their mind, being able to share Christ with somebody as they move along the trail. And we want to thank you for that now. In Jesus' name.
Amen. Amen. God bless you. Have a good night. Yeah, just.